And now we have to show um, the picture for the dienophile. Now, by the way, is the dienophile going to come in from the right, or is it going to come in from below? Below. Below. You might have already learned that in class. Even though we usually draw the reaction as if they're horizontal with each other, what's actually happening is that the diene, I'll put it in the dots again to indicate the interacting atoms, the diene is actually coming in from below. Incidentally, you can see that here. What type of bond are we going to form between these two atoms, pi or sigma? Sigma. sigma. Now, how do you form a sigma bond? Is that side-to-side -side overlap or head-to-head -head overlap? Well, you can see it has to come in from below for there to be a head-to-head -head overlap. If it came in from the side, it would be forming a pi bond, because pi bonds are side-to-side. -side. But since we're forming a sigma bond here, it has to come in from below. Now, which of these two pictures should I put in for the dienophile? Well, I should, we, said we, should, we said we should use the luma. Now, how should I, uh, so let's see, I'm going to shade. If I put the shading down here, then I should put this shading up here. This is what we're, what we're drawing here is the transition state. And then what we have to show is this explains why the diels alder reaction happens. This explains why the diels alder reaction happens. Is this a bonding or an anti-bonding interaction? Bonding. Bonding because we like having the unshaded close to the unshaded. So we should put in some dots here to show this bonding interaction. Remember that that should actually be thought of as constructive interference. These two wave functions are in phase, so to speak, even though we don't need to get into the physics of that too much. And then how about this? Is this a bonding or an anti-bonding interaction? Bonding. bonding. So that's the other part of the explanation for why diels alder works. Um, remember that reactions tend to work when they have um, low activation energies, when there's a favorable transition state. Well, here's what's making this transition state favorable. So your instructor, when would you draw this if the instructor said something like, draw the molecular orbital diagram for the transition state for a diels alder What we've basically drawn here is the molecular orbital diagram for the transition state for a diels alder and we've shown what's making the reaction favorable is these bonding interactions between these asterisk carbons and these dotted carbons. Notice that in this simple case, these back carbons are not playing any role. In this simple case, the back carbons are not playing any role because there's nothing for them to overlap with. So you can see the first thing you have to do is draw the complete molecular orbital diagrams and energy and electron diagrams for both the diene and the dienophile, but then you just pick out the homo from the diene and the lumo from the dienophile, and those are the ones you put in your picture. And notice how we use slanting lines. Up here I drew the dienophile as if it was vertical, but down here it's better to draw it a little bit in a slant so that this line doesn't interfere with these two orbitals. And it doesn't matter if we do it like the other way around, like the bottom one first shaded at top, as long as they're consistent, right? That's right, but, but that's an important technicality. If I'm going to draw this LUMO, I could also have drawn the LUMO like this. I think this is the point you were saying? No, but also having all But then you have to make this match. So if I drew it like this, I'd have to switch these shadings as well so we still get the bonding interactions. That's why I mentioned that technicality before. Sometimes that messes people up when they do the picture because they said, well, gee, I remember from lecture there's supposed to be a bonding interaction, but I'm not getting the bonding interaction. Well, the reason is because they drew the wrong version. So you have to draw the version. So whichever, you can draw the first picture however you like, but then you have to draw the other pictures so that it gives you the bonding interactions. Make sense? So what we've done so far is we've learned how to draw the transition state um, molecular orbital diagram for a simple diels alder reaction. But this didn't have any substituents, so it didn't allow us to explain the endo and the exo. So now we have one more thing to do. Now we have to see what this looks like with some substituents. Well. So we can use, say, this. So now let's say that this is our dienophile. So we're drawing the transition statement? Right. Well, the first thing we have to do is update our molecular orbital pictures. So first of all, is this molecular orbital picture going to be the same or different than before? Same. The same, because we haven't changed the diene at all. And is its, are its electrons going to be the same? Yes. Yeah. Now, how about this picture? Is this picture going to be the same? No, no it's going to be totally different. So we have to start over from scratch. 
So the first thing now to do is, from scratch now, draw the molecular orbital diagram for this picture. Have you draw this picture? You want to draw the more yeah, inline diagram? I wrote this first. Yeah. <laughs> right. Looks like we're doing good. Now, actually, we can notice here that this picture now looks almost exactly, it looks exactly the same as the dying, but that's not surprising. How many overlapping p atomic orbitals do we have now? Four. So we should have four pi molecular orbitals. Remember that the number of overlapping p atomic orbitals tells you how many pi molecular orbitals we are going to have. All of these are sp2. sp2, sp2, sp2. What's the hybridization of this oxygen? It's also sp2, so they all have one p orbital. The only difference is, do we care about the homo here or the lumo for the dienophile? The lumo. The lumo. So let's label the lumo. That's right. I'm not even going to bother labeling the homo here because I don't care about that. All right, now I need to adjust this picture over here. All right, now we have to think about the fact that there's really two different approaches we could have. We could have an approach where if this is our dying over here, would this be the endo or the exo approach? Exo. What's this one? Exo. If this is the dying over here. Endo. This would be the endo, because remember that here the substituent is pointing into the back of the dyne. Endo. Oh, the H substituent? Well, this whole, oh, 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 this right, whole right, thing right. here. Okay. Here's where the dots help us. These are the atoms that are reacting. This whole thing over here is just a substituent. Remember that carbon-oxygen double bonds can't really participate in the reaction, only the carbon-carbon double bonds. Couldn't this also turn around and be XO and then... That would be this picture. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we talked about how usually there isn't really any significance to how what the orientation is on a problem. However, right now, we're specifically thinking about these two possible different approaches. If it literally attacks from this direction, this would be the endo attack, pointing into the back of the dying, and this would be the exo approach. So then we have to draw two possible outcomes here. Notice again how I'm using slanting lines to make the picture come out prettier. And I'm going to keep putting in the dots. 